Hey everyone, Rob from Southgate Media Group here. Before we get started with this podcast, we have a quick message. If this is your first time checking out the show, we love that you found us and we really hope you enjoy it. What we have to say is for the subscribers. If you enjoy our shows, would you please donate to help keep these going? We don't want to have to put traditional ads on these shows, but this does cost money. So we really do rely heavily on donations. To make a donation to the show, please go to our website, www.southgatemediagroup.com. Go to the page for the show, and in the upper right-hand corner is a donate button. It takes you right to PayPal, and you can donate whatever amount you want. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to another installment of Super Connectivity. Hopefully you listened to the Marvel uh, Roundup so you know some of the things we're going to talk about and some of the things you don't know because I am Charlie Esser. With me as always is... Phil Parrish. And we are going to connect everything in Marvel to something else. So, uh, big news out this week. Uh, well, I don't know if it's big news. It's big news for me is we got a map of Battleworld. Uh, did you have a chance to look at the map, uh, Phil? Uh, real quickly, yeah, I did. Okay, here's what is fascinating. Okay, aside from the fact that the universes that we're getting, um, all your favorite universes, 2099, 1602, uh, Quack World, that's Howard the Duck gets his own place in Battle World. Um, we have three different X-Men universes, two of which are concurrent. And this I thought was very fascinating. You got Mutopia. Actually, no, I'm sorry. There's four X-Men universes, four X-Men universes that have been merged into this. But two of them are theoretically 616 continuity. You have the 90s X-Men in uh, Westchester and then Mutopia, which is from another series in the X-Men. Uh, but again, ostensibly within 616. So it's not like these are what-if worlds that have been merged together. These are points in time that pieces of the world of of Marvel Universe have been have been pulled out and stuck in to make this world. I find that utterly fascinating that there's a civil war world, uh, you know, in this where the the civil war, the superhero civil war is going on, and then somewhere else on that planet, it's in a completely different era. And that just blows my mind because I had not even considered that's what they might do. So people are going to be fighting past and future versions of themselves. Exactly. And, you know, and obviously this goes to our fractured timeline with, with, with Ultron. This goes to our, 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 our um, incursion events. And uh, interestingly enough, there is a 616 designated world. It's actually called Manhattan. And half of six, half of it is the the six one six Manhattan. The other half is the, I believe it's the sixteen ten Manhattan, which of course is the Ultimate Universe. So um, very interesting that that, and I, I imagine there's going to be a lot going on there. But um, you know, there's so much that we don't really know about with these worlds, what the worlds are going to be like, what the structures going to be like. But we do did get to, we do get to see a lot of the different worlds. We see that there's a 2099 world. Um, we see that there's a world that's based off of the Spider-Verse crossovers. So exactly what that's going to be, I have no idea. Is it Loom World on World 1? Or is it all of the worlds of all of the Spider-Men sort of jammed into one world where all of the Spider-Men are? Um, there's the Future Imperfect world. There's the Old Man Logan world. I mean, it is... It is insane and intriguing and frightening and wonderful, and I am just excited. Um, and it gives me an idea of what we're going to see at the end of this. Um, and what I'm thinking is, is what Marvel wants to do when we're done is, I know everyone thinks, oh, they're going to make one universe, and it's going to be one contiguous universe. And I'm thinking, no, what we're going to have at Marvel after this is you're going to have four or five ongoing universes where that universe is going to be an established place at the end of this, and we're going to have ongoing adventures and heroes in that universe. Now, what those universes will be, I don't know. Will it be the MC2? Will it be the Ultimate Universe? Will it be the 2099 universe? I don't know, but they're creating a lot of new characters for all of these universes, so it would not surprise me to see 
somehow at the end of this, in, in kind of in the way that DC has their Earth One and Earth Two stories, having the the you know f- four or five top universes as ongoing series. Um, so you're going to have your six one six books, then you're going to have like the secondary books in these other books of four or five heroes, and then they'll bring up new heroes in these other universes. So they're going to have more than one Marvel universe going on at at any given time, and I think that's fascinating. But that's just my speculation. Mm. What do you think, Phil? How, how do you think this all plays out? I don't know. Like you were saying, I mean, I could see them going with the multiple universes, but I didn't know if they'd want to go with like one universe just to make it simpler for you know trying to get new readers to come in. Well, but you see that that's the thing. Having one universe doesn't necessarily make it simpler. Yeah. And 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 not for nothing, they're selling comic books. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's true. You know, it's 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 not like oh, if we only had one Spider-Man book, then people will just buy that one and it'll be easier. No, they're going to have six Spider-Man books <laughs> because they want all of us to go out and buy every single one of those Spider-Man books. Um, and now they'll have Spider-Man on three different worlds or four different worlds, four different types of Spider-Man, plus all the books within their Spider-Mans, and so you'll get like you know. Uh, Web of May Parker and Gw- Spider Gwen's, you know, spectacular stories. You know, you're going to have these different universes within that. W- so you can have one character and multiple lines within them. Um, interestingly enough, looking at the new Spider Gwen book, it looks like it takes place in Spider Gwen's universe. So, and of course, she's not actually called Spider Gwen. She's actually called Spider Woman, but there's all already a spider woman book so they can't call her spider so they can't call her book spider woman even though they call her spider woman in her universe so uh Mm. the difficulties of it all Uh, but um it's it's really really interesting how what they can where they can go from this and what they can do with this and i'm convinced that so we're going to get our 616 back but then and probably you're going to get the ultimate universe back too but we're also going to see two or three other universes that will have at least some test test ongoings and and they'll bring up these universes again and again as they need to, um, which uh, which should be good. And, you know, hopefully one day we might even get the year 2100 since they've been 2099 for like 20 years now. <laughs> But it's still the future, though. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's kind of funny when you think about it. They call it the 2099 universe, but it's so that implies that all of the history of the 2099 books took place in one year. <laughs> yes, but the timeline keeps changing, so. Yes, that's well, of course, that's all thing. Now. It's like, um, I'm just, you know what, I'm, I'm hoping that we get a 1960s universe in this. So that we get that first run fan, Lee and Kirby Fantastic Four and first run Avengers and all those 1960s characters, those characters from that early, early time in this in this battle world as well. That would be awesome, too. And then, you know, you could do very interesting things like you could do a spinoff universe that's 1960s universe. I mean, oh, I, th- I thought you were calling for uh, Spider-Man 68. Yeah. Well, hey, why not? Spider-Man 68 <laughs> would be. We all want it. It'll be there. You watch. Um, well, you know, they kind of touched on to Spider-Man 68 in the Spider-Verse crossover when they go to the cartoon, mm-hmm. when they go to the old 60s Spider-Man cartoon and bring him back into the mix. Um, just as much as Spider-Man as anyone. And uh, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be surprised if they have, you know, a 1960s world come out of this, you know, mm-hmm. and maybe an ongoing series in there. Because, you know, one of Marvel's problems, is, well, I don't say it's been a problem, but the sliding time of the 616 has always been a question. And it will be interesting, because that's one of these questions that, that that's always in this, is will these heroes realize that their timeline has been messed with for so long? Because they have these memories that go back, but for some reason they only go back 20 years, even though they're full of all of this history, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, that could be an interesting thing. I am fascinated by where they're going to break this down because I somehow I always think that Marvel Marvel I feel is never afraid of the crazy explanation you know I don't and I think that we'll get something really insane at the end of this as this is what has been going on in the Marvel universe this whole time and we're going to go oh wow that makes everything make sense even though it makes no sense at all so <laughs> and that's what I live for from Marvel comics but um you know, we got to get this into our half hour because people are walking their dogs and taking their lunch breaks. 
So do you have anything else to say about Battle World, Phil? Uh, no. Then let's get into Moon Knight. <laughs> Tell us about Moon Knight, Philip, because I know you're reading him right now. Uh, well, where should we start? Uh, gets his abilities from the Egyptian god Khonshu. At times, is a split personality. Yes. Well, you know, um, in many ways, I think he was uh, created in to be sort of a Batman pastiche for uh, for a Marvel comics. You have you no, know, uh, you know, millionaire fights crime, character of the dark, and of course, it's it's that he is also in at times that that opposite of Batman because of course he has the white costume um, as opposed to the black costume, but still very much plays on that idea of striking fear in the heart of, uh, of, of, uh, of villains. Um, you know, what's interesting about, uh, um, uh, a uh, moon Knight is that he has been a heavily retconned character. And again, to go into what Marvel does to play with its own crazy is they decided that because they had so many retcons on this character, what if we decide, what if we say that all these retcons weren't so much retcons as just, uh, Phil, um, Mark Spector. I almost called him Phil Spector. Speaking <laughs> of, what if Mark Spector's basically, what if basically Mark Spector is crazy and all of these stories he's been telling about himself were just that, just stories, just these outlandish tales. But what if they also were real at the same time? And that's where we get what I think is the current view of, of, of Mark Spector, which is that he is, somewhat mentally unstable, but that he is at the same time insanely mystically powerful, either because of this God uh, Kanshu or because he believes that there is a God Kanshu giving him these powers and that what he believes to be real becomes real. Um, you know, this is what is interesting about Moon Knight in his own way in that he is, if you take that view of him, he is this ultimate extension of, you know, um, uh, superpowers an ex- as, uh, as an extension of your inner mental self, your inner mental ability to v- view the world, and you, your your superpowers are an expression of your own internal internal potential. Um, you know, uh, Kanshu, uh, sorry, Moon Knight. You know, depending on depending depending on the story. Like if you go back to his old, as I was saying in in our um, earlier podcast, uh, if you go back to his um, you know, handbook of the Marvel universe, uh, from the eighties, you know, his, his powers were tied to the moon. It was very straightforward. His powers were tied to the moon during a new moon. He was just a super athlete at during a full moon. He was Hulk level strong, uh, and not invulnerable. Um, and his powers would wax and wane according to the moon, because of course he was tied to the moon by the God Kanchu, who was a moon God in this ancient Egyptian temple that he found. um, now, of course, when they re rebooted him, I believe it was was it in the two thousands? Yeah, I think it was in the two thousand. He had he had a co- come back in the nineties, which was a very straightforward uh, Mark Spector, mm-hmm. you know, millionaire Batman type character. Uh, partnered up with a character named Midnight, who in the most recent series, like, is an insane villain now. Um, although I think he killed him in this series, although I'm not entirely certain because I haven't been reading the New Moon Knight. I picked it up periodically. It's all Moon Knight is always a fun read. That's what I'll tell you about Moon Knight. He's always fun to read. Um, but you know, he's never been, he's always been one of these characters where I can only follow sporadically just cause I don't have the time and money to read him. But, um, but yeah, yeah. there was a, yeah, there was a 2006 series. That's when, uh, Midnight showed up, but Midnight's like a cyborg now. So, I mean, he's been ripped apart and put back together so many times. Yeah. Well, cause he started out as, uh, cause I think, I think it was, I think it was the late nineties he had a series. Yeah. Yeah. There was like late eighties, late eighties, yeah. early nineties. Yeah. Mark Spector, Moon Knight. Yeah. That's when Midnight first showed up. He was yeah. like the son of one of his old enemies. Yes. And he, w- and he was working to be, um, Moon Knight's sidekick when he first shows up. At least that mm-hmm. was his story. And that was a good series. You had Doc Voodoo, um, or sorry, Brother Voodoo. He, although he wasn't, he was a doctor. He didn't go by Doctor Voodoo then. He didn't go by Doctor Voodoo until he became Sorcerer Supreme. Um, he was just Brother Voodoo because he was a character from the 1970s. Um, and he's back because everything old is new again. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's he he's a fascinating character in that 
his view of his own reality is so fractured, which fits so well into our new fractured Marvel universe, which is coming unhinged as we rocket towards our secret wars every single day. Um, and one imagines that characters like Moon Knight, you know, I, and this is what I'm, th- I'm wondering if characters like Moon Knight, characters like the Sentry, characters like Deadpool, who are these characters who are at their core unhinged from the reality in which they are. And yet at the same time, supremely powerful in their own existence. Um, I wonder if they're going to be a key to the secret wars that we're coming towards as we come into, uh, the breaking down of the Marvel universe and then its eventual re- reconstruction. Um, you know, um, especially with a character like Deadpool, uh, you know, who, as I've said, is, is Marvel's ambush bug because he is comically aware. He's aware of his own fictional existence. And in Ambush Bug, uh, during Son of Ambush Bug, it was, it was suggested that he was in many ways the most powerful character in the DC universe expressly because he understood he was fictional. So anything that happened to him, he could, he, he could simply change, he could go to the next panel and he could undo what had happened to him because he was fictional. And so he could retcon, he, he could sort of, he could sort of move into the next panel and it would be fixed. It was, it was a very fascinating, very fascinating deconstruction on the um, concept of fictionality. And, you know, Marvel has been playing with that idea a lot as it gets into um, also the character of Loki very much in Loki's first series played very heavily onto the idea of fictionality among the gods and how the gods were their stories and that the stories of the gods were their reality. And if superheroes are modern gods, then in their own way, their stories are their reality. And if Mark Spector is like the, is, is the God Khonshu, his story is his own reality and that it's separated and disjointed from what we think of as the larger reality is irrelevant to the truth of that reality. Because that idea that there is a consistent reality is the myth. The, the truth is that the, everything is a story. And for numerous reasons, I think this is something that cosmologically Marvel has been building to for a while. And the first hint I ever saw of that was actually in, um, I believe it was called it was the mighty, uh, the incredible Hercules series when Hercules is trying to explain to Amadeus Cho, you know, the myths of the gods and, and, and Amadeus is telling him that's impossible. You've already, how could that have happened if this other thing had happened? And he says, you don't understand it's, you know, it's different for gods. It's different when you are, when you are the story and the story becomes who you are. And so right now we see Marvel deconstructing its own stories and moving us to a place where all the stories in the Marvel universe are going to become one story on battle world. And that is going to be the new reality. The new reality is going to be the laid bare fictionality of the Marvel universe. One imagines, um, or maybe not. (laughs) It's going to hit the fan. Yeah, it's going to hit the fan. And, and, and to that point, just to get back to actually there's some reality here as well. Uh, one thing else I wanted to talk about, we both wanted to talk about, um, was, well, actually I wanted to talk about this. Um, the, the death of Ian Rogers and what that means is, um, because of course they've emphasized Ian's death numerous times in this issue. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ian is dead and Zemo killed him and Sam has to make Zemo pay for that. And it makes me wonder, are they, are they emphasizing Zemo, uh, Ian's death because it just for dramatic tension or, uh, are they doing it to throw off the fact that Ian isn't really dead? And here's what I'm thinking. Now, Ian has, of course, the nomad title, which of course was previously held by, um, uh, Jack Monroe, who of course was the 1950s Bucky driven insane by the uh, uh, knockoff super soldier serum that he had. Um, and then Jack Monroe went on to be manipulated and uh, messed over by S.H.I.E.L.D., by Hydra, by a lot of people. And I'm wondering if Ian actually isn't dead, but is 
basically they want people to think he's dead because they want it to be a blow to Captain America. And then they're going to have him come back after he's been manipulated by Zemo, by Zola, by everyone else to be Cap's own undoing, um, which is what people have tried to do with Jack Monroe in the past. Um, and I can see that as a very real possibility, um, in all honesty. Um, you know, uh, the character of Ian, like, I think he's too interesting of a character to just kill off. I think that bringing him back just to kill him off doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, one of the reasons why I thought that maybe it was meant to be an earlier arc in the Fear Him story was because then you would have had, you know, um, eight issues, which theoretically would have been eight months in, well, actually it would have been five issues and five months in before you got to the death of Ian. So you would have at least built up a little of a story for him. But, um, where we're, you know, it just seems, it just seems to me like killing off Ian, um, seems odd in, not in, not in what Marvel would normally do. Um, although I think that letting people think Ian de- is dead so that he can be manipulated is very much what Marvel would normally do. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, I also come to this idea, you know, that is st- that even though he calls himself Ian Rogers, he's still a Zola. Mm-hmm. And I don't think Zemo really is going to want to get an enemy like Zola uh, by killing off his son, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, heroes and villains be darned. Um, you know, to 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 Zola, Ian is very valuable in the same way that Jet Black was very valuable. So I think we're going to see Ian and Jet Black back together under Zola, and that's going to be a whole other story, uh, possibly resolved in future issues. Mm. And that's that's my thought on that. What do you, what do you, what, what do you think? How, how do you how do you see the um, playing of, of Ian's death, Phil? Um, I don't know. I keep thinking that they're going to reveal that he's not really dead, maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It just seemed like they they killed him off pretty quick in this new, all-new Captain America series. Yeah. I mean, why, um, why, I mean, why, why didn't they kill him off the end? If they were going to kill him, why didn't they kill him at the end of the last series? Yeah. Well, because they obviously wanted to kill him off here right. um, or have something else happen to him, you know? I mean, killing off, killing off Ian, you know, it's like this. I can definitely see... I mean, he is essentially a disposable character. He's a character who's had um, uh, importance infused into him uh, uh, through his Captain America arc. And, you know, they had him survive. I mean, he, he actually was supposed to have died in that, and he survived. And that gave us our Captain America arc with um, so that Ian grows up in Dimension Z and then later comes back. Um and so we have this infused in value to this character to make his death meaningful, which I, I think is something that they emphasized in this, which is that Ian's death is going to just tear Captain America apart. Maybe even show why he's so angry when he's going after the Illuminati in in two months' time. Uh, um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, entirely possible. You know, this could be the thing that breaks Captain America, uh, and maybe intentionally. And then, of course, um, bringing him back, you know, at the end, it's just a nice little twist to the knife. Um, like I said, the main reason I don't think they killed Zola was because, uh, or they didn't kill Ian, is because he is Zola's son. I don't think that um, even Zemo is going to risk angering Zola, mm-hmm. just because he is Zola and he is dangerous. And that's my thoughts on this. Um, I think we covered a lot here, Phil. What do you think? Oh, yeah. Battle World, Moon Knight, Captain America. <laughs> And the very nature of superhumanity and the fractured uh, character of story and gods and heroes. And so I hope you all followed all of that and connected with it. And if you didn't, well, we'll connect something else next week. Uh, I have been Charlie Esser. You can follow me at Charlie Esser on Twitter or email me at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. Uh, find me on Facebook, uh, Charlie Esser, and like me there. And Phil, who are you? Uh, I'm Phil Parrish. You can uh, email me at nightwingpdp at gmail.com, and I'm on Twitter at nightwingpdp. And definitely listen to Before the Bat, one of the best podcasts on the uh, Southgate Media Network. Um, after you're done listening to all the nu- nu- all the 200 Nuff Said uh, feeds, mm-hmm. definitely get into Before the Bat uh, and the world's finest roundup. Um, and this has been Super Connectivity for another week. <laughs>